Screen Time Stories is presented by Pinwheel. Pinwheel gives kids and teens a smartphone experience that actually supports healthy development. I'm Julie, and as a parent, I know that embracing technology today is a must. Our kids will log on whether we like it or not. So let's lean into the challenges and joys of parenting with tech by learning from the latest research and experts in the field. This is Screen Time Stories, parenting techniques for raising tech natives. Let's figure this out together. Today we're talking to Garrett Johnson of Fight the New Drug, an anti-pornography organization. Before diving into our conversation, let's review some concepts surrounding porn, especially as it relates to teenagers. First off, how many of our teenagers are actually watching porn? Well, that's tough to estimate since we're relying on self-reporting. I can tell you that a longitudinal study published in 2022 found that 63 to 68% of teens have watched porn in their lifetime and 23 to 42% have watched in the last year. And the main source smartphones with that initial foray being unexpected about half the time. This study is linked in the show notes. If you'd like to check on how the researchers came to these numbers, I think it's safe to say that most of us parents feel concerned about our kids watching pornography especially with the ease of access these days. We just have to keep in mind that sexual curiosity, especially for maturing teens, is normal, and that curiosity is the major driver here. So far, researchers have not agreed on the negative impacts that viewing porn has on teens, but the potential exists, especially for kids dealing with mental health conditions. With this in mind, we need to be a trusted resource to our teens, and that means Absolutely no shaming, no judgment. I want to talk to Garrett now for some specific advice. Hi, Garrett. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yep. Thanks for having us. This is the second episode in a two-part series, helping parents navigate the modern world of pornography. Last week, I asked Kristen Jensen of Defend Young Minds to help parents of younger kids understand this topic. Today, I want to gear the conversation toward parents of older kids, and I want you to help me and my audience get a better handle on this because you represent the anti-porn organization, Fight the New Drug. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, we are Fight the New Drug. My name is Garrett Johnson, and like you said, I'm a representative of Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug exists to provide individuals an opportunity to make an educated decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts and to sum up that mission statement it's again to educate we exist to educate we want people to be able to consider before consuming is kind of the goal and The reason why that's the goal is because we think that once individuals are able to consider the harmful effects of pornography and make an educated decision, we think that a big percentage of them are going to going to turn away from pornography consumption because of the potential negative consequences. Okay. How did you get into this? I hadn't heard of fight the new drug back in 2016. I had never heard of fight the new drug, even though they had existed since 2009. And I happened to uh, hear about fight the new drug. And I was your typical porn consumer at that time. I was married and we had kids. And again, I was just your typical consumer. I didn't I was experiencing some of the negative consequences of porn consumption, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't, um, they, you know, the, the coined phrase, name it to tame it. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't name it because I just didn't know about the harmful effects of pornography. So I continued in my porn consumption. And in my particular case, I was doing it in secrecy, even though I was married. And so did disrupt my relationship with my wife and, The good news is that after hearing about Fight the New Drug, I was able to address my porn consumption and pivot away from pornography. Uh, Today, I'm very grateful and 
proud that I am porn free. And I feel like I'm experiencing a higher level of living. Like uh, I feel more joy and uh, a better connection with my wife in every aspect of our relationship. And so that's how I heard about Fight the New Drug. Once I heard about them, I did a couple projects to build awareness for Fight the New Drug. I uh, am a big fan of endurance events. And so I decided to use that talent and I ran 30 marathons in 30 days wearing handcuffs, which represented like the addictive nature of pornography. Um, not saying that everyone that consumes porn is addicted, but in my case, I, I kind of self diagnose as like my consumption as a compulsive, um, at a compulsive level. So that, and then after I did that project, I rode my bicycle across the United States, dragging chains which represented like the heaviness that porn can add to society and individuals and relationships. So I did those two projects and then I started presenting for fight the new drug. And today I've presented to over 200 audiences around the, around the world. Thank you so much for sharing your, your personal story. That was very vulnerable. And I appreciate that so much because I think that a lot of times um, shame and embarrassment can keep us from talking about things. And then this thing that's happening in secrecy, um, to somebody else, it can feel, um, very lonely and, yeah. then, you know, and, and it's hard to, it's hard to overcome these obstacles when everybody just stays silent. Mm. Um, and I was going to ask you about this. I, I thought maybe you misspoke when you said 30 marathons in 30 days, but then you said, you drug chains across the U.S. on your bicycle. Mm, yeah. So I don't think that it was, I think that you did 30. Yeah, I did. I, <laughs> I've i done lot. some pretty cool endurance events in my life. Um, like I've ran 100 miles straight. I've performed a marathon backwards. I've performed a marathon barefoot. Wow. I've done a couple Ironmans. So I'm a definitely like, I have that within me to do endurance events. And so I utilize that to like, to build awareness. Yeah. So yeah, you heard correct, 30. <laughs> Can you tell me more what that means to you on a personal level when you do this kind of um you know, marathon that has this this big um symbolic piece connected mm -hmm. to it. What what does this mean for you? I look at life as an endurance event and I think life is the ultimate endurance event. And so I've always enjoyed endurance events because to me, they signify like a piece of life. And, and then I start wondering and I get curious about what I can learn from those different endurance events that I do. And every endurance event that I go into, my goal is not to go fast and my goal is not to win. The only goal really is to enjoy the experience and to finish. And every endurance event that, that I've started, I've finished which has been a really cool thing for me. And it has allowed me to learn to focus on myself because for example, when I did the, I did an event called the Wasatch 100 and, and you run hundred miles straight by yourself. And during the 100 miles, you gain 25,000 feet of elevation and you dropped 25,000 feet of elevation. It's so it's through the mountains mm -hmm. and Going into that event, I had no clue what I was doing. I was not experienced in that type of event, but I was able to finish. And one of the reasons why is because I focused on myself. I looked inward. I got real curious about what my behavior was like, like my consumption, um, my fluid intakes. I was really slow. Like I kept my pace. I didn't try to, I didn't try to win or beat anyone else. It was all about, you know, me versus me. And so I think all of these lessons are applicable to this conversation as well. Um, and speaking to your audience, this is kind of pivoting away from your question, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that if someone does have a challenge with pornography, if they experience unwanted, if they're currently experiencing unwanted or problematic porn consumption, sometimes, like you said, the person wants to hide, they feel shame. They don't want to talk about their challenge. And so if a person listening to this has a challenge with pornography, sometimes they feel like they can't talk to it because they're currently engaging in porn consumption. But I challenge that. I think that they actually have a, 
a very unique perspective that should be shared because if, if they can get over the shame that that's in, involved in this process, if they can get over it and talk to it, I think that they can help a lot of people, especially their children. Yeah. Um, if you tend, if we tend to not want to talk about those challenges that we have, and when we do that, I think they just kind of, it's miss it's a missed opportunity. I think that if a person currently is experiencing unwanted porn consumption, they can still help their kids mm-hmm. if they can engage in some openness in an appropriate way. And what I mean by that is I'm open with my kids about the porn consumption that I engaged in. And I think it makes me a better parent. And even during times when I, like I said, today, I am porn free, zero consumption. That was always the goal, but I always wasn't, I wasn't able to achieve that for a period of time, even though I wanted to. And so that's why we refer to it as unwanted porn consumption. You're acknowledging, I don't want this in my life, but it can be very difficult to quit. So even during those times where you're still consuming, but it's unwanted porn consumption, I think that healthy conversation can facilitate healthier behavior in your kids. And uh, I think that my porn consumption, my experience with porn consumption and my, the way that I've addressed it makes me a better parent. My kids know I'm an open book. They know about my past behavior and they, I think it makes me a better parent. It makes me more relatable. It facilitates more healthy conversation. And I think the key point is that you have a consumption challenge. I feel like the key is to acknowledge. Is oh, yeah. I think for it, for you to be able to have healthy conversations with your kids, I think you're right that the acknowledgement part would have to be there. Um, how old are your kids? They're nine and almost eight okay. and four. Okay. So on the younger end, on but the we're, younger end. we're getting up into there. The average age of first time exposure, I mean, all studies, there's several studies and they're all a little bit different. They vary in age, but it's safe to say that the majority of people have viewed pornography by age 13. Yeah. So I'm sure that's on your mind. And that's something that as a parent, so not just as a professional, but as a parent, you're also thinking about your kids getting older and reaching their middle and high school years, which, Mm -hmm. you know, is really what we want to focus on today. These, these older kiddos, because they're facing an entirely different experience than kids that are, you know, eight and nine years old. Right. Um, I'm curious when it comes to the middle and high schoolers, just on a daily basis, you know, they've got their routine going, they're going to school and everything. They've got their extracurricular activities. I'm curious about the ease of access that they have. How, how are they accessing pornography? So today's, today's internet allows for a level of access that is unprecedented. Today's internet porn is unlike anything the world has ever seen. And one of the challenges that we face as an organization and as a society is that we have previous generations who their their experience with porn is very different compared to what youth are facing today. Very, very, very different. And so one of the challenges is to get them on the same page because previous generations, uh, they, when they think porn, they think of, usually they typically think of playboy and today. And then it's very possible that a lot of these people who think of playboy as porn, they don't know what today's like the current landscape looks like. So you asked about accessibility and it's unheard of. It's unprecedented. The ease of access. A person with a cell phone is just a couple clicks away from the most graphic material available. And again, when we say the most graphic material available, we're not just saying like a, a woman with her shirt off in a cornfield, like a playboy used to be. We are talking about violent, aggressive, degrading material. Uh, There's research that says that as much as one in three or as as few as one in three and as much as nine in 10 videos, mainstream internet porn videos today show violence or aggression. 
and 97% of the time, women are the targets of that violence and aggression. And what kind of issues does that cause with our youth? There's something in psychology called the social learning theory, which states that we don't actually have to experience something to learn. It's, it states that an individual can learn through observation and through imitation. And so there, there was another study that showed that one out of every eight porn titles that are presented to first time visitors to porn websites are include violence or aggression in the title. So if you're saying, how does this impact the viewer? It's because, I mean, it impacts them in their interest Mm -hmm. in, in what they're interested in. Um, Going back to the social learning theory, it influences their likes, their dislikes and their preferences. There's something called neuroplasticity, which means that our brains are constantly changing. So everything that we do on the daily and on the hourly affects our likes, our dislikes, and our preferences. And so if someone goes and views pornography and that pornography is violent, aggressive, then maybe at first they're, they feel disgusted or they feel they're, they're not interested in that type of pornography. But we can talk about this a little bit more that there's one of the markers for addiction is desensitization that a person becomes desensitized, meaning that they need more more often or a more hardcore version to get the same level of spike in the reward pathway. So as a person starts consuming porn and they're introduced to these violent themes at maybe at first they don't enjoy it. They're not interested, but then after a while, because of desensitization and they're seeking novelty um, to spike the reward pathway, then it's, it's, possible. It doesn't happen with every consumer, but it's possible that they start turning to these themes that once discussed to them. And then would you say, are there any studies that show that this kind of behavior translates outside of the screen? So when they're Mm. in real life and, you know, having, they're in a relationship, is there any potential that, or any causation that that type of porn could lead to violent or aggressive behavior? Yeah. It's tough because it's that old adage that says that correlation does not equal causation. Uh, There's definitely correlation between what's being viewed and behaviors. There is a study that says that of in this particular study, 47% of respondents responded that over time they began consuming pornography that once disinterested or even disgusted them. And so we want to be clear that, again, that doesn't mean that everyone is going to experience that. Um, In that study alone, if 47% of the respondents said they did experience that, 53% did not. Um, But going to your question, like, is there correlation or is there there research showing that it's going to actually affect behavior? Um, There's an anecdotal example that I want to share, and it's from a very popular series on tv right now it's viewed by a ton of people and in the first episode there's a scene where a a guy and a girl are engaging sexually and the guy reaches up and starts to strangle the girl and to depict why he's doing this this particular show froze the scene And then they popped up on the screen images and videos from one of the most popular porn sites in the world, which is Pornhub. And they populate and they start showing videos that this kid has consumed, insinuating that he consumed these videos and now he's acting them out on his girlfriend. And she, she was actually very scared and she didn't like that strangulation and she was not okay with that. She never consented to it. And he was confused in the video, like in the movie or in the show, he was confused as to why she wasn't into it because he had learned that women are okay with that. Yeah. So you're saying even if we don't have that, you know, fleshed out peer reviewed data showing that there's a direct causation it's kind of just accepted 
on a social level that there's a, there's a very good possibility that this kind of pornography will lead to that kind of behavior. Yeah, I think it goes back to the social learning theory in psychology, which again states that we don't have to actually experience something to learn and it does impact our behavior. Yeah. It does those expectations, those it does influence our sexuality and our view of what is healthy sex. So I think it is just common knowledge. It's like if a kid watches Spider Man, they're like my, for example, my boy after watching Spider Man, he thinks that he like wants to get bit by a spider. It's just common sense it, that kids are influenced by what they consume. Yeah. I'm just curious if there's any other long term effects from consumption. Um, whether it's overconsumption or consuming, you know, violent, aggressive, just, you know, cover the basis for me. Are there any other long-term effects that we as parents should be aware of? There's a famous psychologist, his name's Donald Hebb, and there's something called Hebb's Rule. And you've probably heard this before. It states that neurons that fire together wire together. So if we're talking about long-term negative consequences, the more porn that's consumed, the more those neurons fire together, the more they become permanent. Another way to look at it is think of sledding. Let's say you go out and you are, there's a fresh set of snow, like a new snowfall. And you start sledding. You create these paths within the snow. And after that hill has been sledded on for a significant period of time, those paths become permanent. And the neural pathways within our brain are very similar to that. The more they're used, the longer they are there, the more permanent they become. When we're talking about an individual wanting to experience life and enjoy life to the fullest, then that individual shouldn't have or can't have compulsive behaviors. Like if a person wants to become the best version of themselves, compulsive behavior is not in that equ equation. And we are hardwired for connection. And so I think that it's important to note that because we're hardwired for connection and we, we each of us want to become the best version of ourselves and enjoy as many moments of bliss as possible, then we we want to eliminate any compulsive behavior mm -hmm. and pornography. It, it can be very difficult to quit and it can become an escalating behavior. And we can, we can dive into that more. Like why is pornography difficult? Why can it be difficult to quit? That's an interesting thing to talk about because you can compare it to Pavlov and his dogs. Do you watch The Office at all? Yes, I've seen, I believe I've seen every episode. Do you remember the episode with Dwight and Jim where Jim, every time he restarts his computer, like mm -hmm. the window sound happens and then he offers Dwight uh, an Altoid <laughs> and he's, he's performing this experiment on Dwight to help him or to train him using Pavlov's discoveries. And so that's a funny, funny thing. But Pavlov discovered that our brain can form subconscious, subconscious associations between things, yeah. even when those th things seem unrelated. And so when it comes to pornography, um, pornography, you, subconscious associations can be made. Um, and that can be a certain time of day. It can be the laptop. It can be uh, loneliness, boredom. It can be a certain person. It can be a certain emotion. And all of these things can trigger a person to consume pornography. And when that happens again and again and again, these pathways become more and more permanent. Mm -hmm. And so you've probably heard a smoker or a former smoker say with complete sincerity, they say, I hate cigarettes. I never want to see another cigarette in my life. But then if they're presented with certain triggers like Pavlov's discovered those subconscious associations that can be formed, 
then they it's possible they turn back and consume more cigarettes, even though they hate them. Yeah. And so when we're talking about the long-term effects, the fact that it can be difficult to quit is a very significant long-term effect because each of us want to become the best version of ourselves. And I think with unwanted porn consumption, it's tough to do that. And I agree with you. And I just, you know, we, we talked about this for a minute before I started recording the safeguards that are in place. Um, don't seem to be setting up our youth for success. Um, when it comes to cigarettes, you have to be 18 to go in and show your ID. And there are some pretty rigorous safeguards in place. Of course, they can get them from friends. But um, when you buy a cell phone and take it home and you plug it in for the first time, what, like, take it away from here. What do we have set up as a society to protect our youth? Very, very little. The only thing between a uh, minor and adult content, the most graphic content on the internet is just a couple clicks. So once an individual, once a kid has a smartphone, he or she can access free tube sites. And so when we think, when we say free tube sites, Think of YouTube. YouTube is a tube site and it has an auto populate type of mechanism within YouTube. You go to YouTube, you search something, and then once that video finishes, it's going to populate a new video for you, despite whether you want it to or not. And so the, the free tube sites that we're talking about, um, one of the most popular ones is Pornhub. And there's so many, there's countless uh, free tube sites out there. And so to access this free tube site, a kid needs to go to the site or search within Google and then click on the site and it will ask them if they are 18 years old and uh, they have to check a box that they are 18 and press verify. Once they verify, then they have access to unlimited content. Then they're and, in. So that's it. That's it. All right. So I'm curious, why are they even, why are they even wanting to do this? Whenever I have a challenging parenting um, issue, I like to try to consider where is my kid coming from? And so these kids that are hopping on Pornhub, what's their mentality? Like, why mm. is this attractive to them? Mm. That's a great question. I love this question. I think that there's multiple things, multiple, multiple variables that can influence a kid to want to search this. Um, I think it's important to note at this moment that healthy conversation around this topic is very healthy and very important. If we just tell our kids, don't, don't, don't. And we just, you know, take that wagging your finger approach. It's not a great approach when it comes to this topic. Uh, my friend told me about this individual and his, his son had to go to the hospital because he stuck a marker up his nose and he had to get the marker removed and by a professional. So the doctor was talking to this kid after and said, why did you put the marker up your nose? And the kid's response was very telling. The kid's response was because my dad told me not to. <laughs> right. So it's. It shows that if we just say, don't, 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 that our kids often do that. Yeah. Another way to look at it is if you put a bunch of kids in a room, if you have kids yourself, you can try this out, put them in a room and say, you can play with all of the toys in this room, except for this one mm -hmm. and give them one toy they can't play with and then leave the room, come back a few minutes later. And it's very probable that they're going to be playing with this, the one toy you told them not to. Yeah. And so... I think that's one of the variables. If we just have these conversations and all we say is don't, 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 we are placing the focus on the thing and we are increasing their curiosity, mm -hmm. even though they're already born with curiosity around sexuality. So that's the other variable. We are hardwired for connection. And as we mature, the body reacts in certain ways. And that is a natural curiosity that can't be extinguished really. So kids oftentimes will turn to Google for their sex ed. Mm -hmm. And that's very problematic. You do not want Google to answer your kids' sex questions because they're, you know, it's not going to be correct. It's going to be very dangerous. Um, 
it can be. Uh, so that's another variable. And then another variable as to why kids turn to pornography, there's a famous psychologist, his name's Edward Thorndike. And Edward Thorndike has something that's referred to as Edward Thorndike's law of effect, which states that if something has a satisfying response, or if it's perceived at a sa- as a satisfying response, then it's very likely that that behavior or substance will be used again in the future. And so when it comes to porn consumption, a significant amount of viewers are going to experience a spike in the reward pathway because we are hardwired for connection. So if they experience a spike in the reward pathway from consumption, it's very likely they turn to that again in the future, especially if they're not able to consider the harmful effects and they're doing so impulsively with no forethought of possible consequences. Yeah. How do we talk to our kids about that? Because, you know, opening up that conversation, we don't want to keep it. We don't want to keep secrets from each other. We want to be able to be open and let them know this is not an off the table topic. This is something we want to discuss with them. What does that conversation look like? How do we, how do we start it? It's, it's awkward, right? It's awkward for parents, right? Mm. In our family, it's not awkward. Uh, my wife and I and our three kids, it's it's not awkward, but uh, I think that it's common that it is awkward. And I think that we've earned the right for it to not be. And that doesn't take one conversation. It doesn't take two conversations. It doesn't take 10 conversations. It probably, we've probably over the nine years of parenting, we've probably had hundred a hundred or more conversations and with our you kids. Your kids' ages. Nine, eight, and four. So you're talking about having these conversations at an age appropriate level throughout mm-hmm. their entire lives. Yeah. Beginning at day one. I mean, yeah. not day one specifically, but just. Yeah. I think even at day one, it, it, because the conversations don't have to be verbal. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, te- teaching healthy connection from day one, from the day the baby's born, uh, Meaning when we hold our kids close to us, when we, when the mother nurses the the baby, like the kids learning mm-hmm. at every moment that these are healthy connections. And, uh, so it does begin from day one, but obviously you're not having conversations with them at that point. But I think that the conversations, so we have a rule in our house that when our kids ask a question, we answer the question immediately and honestly, and so that provides us with an openness that is, uh, in, in my opinion, a healthy level of openness because our kids aren't afraid to come to us mm-hmm. and they, they know they're not going to get in trouble for a question. Yeah. And we encourage that curiosity and uh, we have a tool, speaking of tools that can be utilized, we have a tool on our website called the Let's Talk About Porn. It's a conversation blueprint. And for your listeners that want to check it out, they can do so very easily by following this link. It's FTND. So fight the new drug FTND.org forward slash blueprint. And we've, we've partnered with professionals and it helps you navigate this conversation. Cause like you said, the first conversation, yeah, it's going to be awkward for you and your kid's like until you've had a lot of conversations, it's very probable that they're not going to want to talk to you about this Mm -hmm. and it is going to be awkward. And so this conversation blueprint tool can be a tool that helps you navigate that conversation in the most healthy way possible. And so you go there, yeah, you select who you are. And then again, it will help you. You'll say, I'm a mom and I want to talk with my kid about porn. Mm -hmm. And then it will help you through that conversation, tailor it to your situation. So check that out. And I'll, I'll add that to the show notes too, to make it a little bit easier to click through. Um, so if, so that's, that's when things are going along smoothly. If we have some kind of concern about our child's involvement with consuming porn, what would you say to that parent in terms of how they interact with their child? Yeah. So today, because of the ease of access of pornography, It's not a matter of if your kid's going to be exposed to pornography. It's a matter of when they're going to be exposed to pornography. So if a, if a parent or a caregiver learns that their kid has been exposed to pornography, I think the first 
one of the first things is going to be to take some deep breaths and realize that this is going to happen because of the world that we live in. You asked like, what is the attitudes? Like, what are the attitudes of the consumers? Like the high school, junior high kids, like what are the attitudes surrounding porn consumption? It's very accepted. It's very normal to consume porn. I, I've talked a little bit about Pornhub. Pornhub is one of the most popular porn sites out there and they host a lot of violent and aggressive material, but they estimate from their own estimates. So who knows if these are true because it's coming from the porn company. But in 2019, they, they said that they had 42 billion searches on their, just their one website, mm-hmm. 42 billion searches. That's uh, I know these numbers just because I do this for work. That's 115 million searches per day. Wow. And uh, that's just one website. Yeah. And so the, the por- porn is very normalized in junior high and high school. And so if you find out that your kid has consumed porn, I think the first thing is going to be to not be surprised. Mm-hmm. Take some deep breaths and then go to the conversation blueprint before you go and talk to them because it is going to give you some good guidance. But I also think it's important to note that there's something called post-traumatic growth. It's a scientific, it's research-based. And oftentimes in psychology, if you go to a psychologist or a therapist and they're diagnosing people, they're going to diagnose what is wrong with you, right? They're diagnosing people with depression or with anxiety or with PTSD. So if we look at PTSD, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. And it says this negative event happened to you. And since then you haven't been able to recover. So when we experience a negative event in our lives, we fall into three categories. Like the person follows into one of three categories. The first category is you experience the negative event and then you experience a low and you remain at that low indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So the second group is going to be the group that they experience the negative event, they experience a low, but then they return to where they were before, whether that's through therapy or time or mindfulness or all these different things. The third group is what's called to, is what's referred to as post-traumatic growth. And so you experience the negative event, you experience the low, you experience the like PTSD, and then post-traumatic growth states that you can actually become a better version of yourself because of the negative event. So you don't just return to where you were before the negative event happened. You actually rise above it. You become better because of the negative event. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think this is important to note is that when a parent discovers that their kid has been exposed to pornography one time, or if they are currently consuming pornography regularly, there is hope. There is hope. The person, the individual can become a better version of themselves. And this a negative event of porn consumption can become a catalyst to push them to who they want to be and what they want to experience out of life. So I think it's important to know because as parents, we often jump to the, like the worst case scenario mm-hmm. and we start thinking, man, what is, what is this going to, what's, how is this going to impact my child? And we always think about the negative side. But I think that we can uh, also look to the hopeful side, which states that kids can overcome this. It's the research and personal accounts of thousands of people show that with effort and time that the harmful effects of pornography, the damages can be reversed. And yeah. That's awesome. I, I'm so glad that we can end on a positive note because it can feel there there's so much negativity wrapped up in this topic and so much hopelessness it's okay we we can make it through it together yeah well Garrett, thank you so much for your time today i appreciate you so much sharing your personal stories and all of this really really excellent data to help us get through every day and you know the first 18 years plus. Yeah, for sure. Yep. To everyone listening, if you have any challenges with parenting with tech, please send me an email at julie at pinwheel.com and let me know how I can help.